Hey, 7th grade, Miss Boy here with your outside reading. So, I'm going to go through chapters 1 through 3 of this novel, but first I want to talk about your author for just a minute. As far as C.S. Lewis, um, considered one of the greatest Christian writers in history, and this series, um, The Chronicles of Narnia, it's his series that he purposely wrote for children. And if you read the series from beginning to end, it goes through and tells the different parts of the Bible like in a broad overview. So the first one talks about creation. Um, this one will talk about what it means. Um, the next, um, in the next couple books, you have um, salvation in there. Uh, you, I mean, the last one's called The Last Battle, Revelations. So this book presents biblical themes in a more lighthearted way for children, which is how he wanted it to be. Okay, so something you'll notice about this series is at the beginning of your novel, it'll give you um, maps and it gives a wonderful list of characters. So usually what it does with his character lists in all of his books, it starts off with the most important. And then the further along you get in the list of characters, um, they tend to be, not that they're trivial, but they might not play a huge part in this novel, but they're in here and they're going to be important later on in the series. Okay, so we're going to start off with our four children, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy, and they are forced to leave London because of World War II. And you see a lot of kids being sent out of the cities and sent out into the country because it's safer, um, um, less likely to be bombed, etc. So they get to go stay with the old professor in his huge mansion. And it describes him as a very old man with shaggy white hair, which grew over most of his face as well as on his head. And he's odd looking and the kids pick up on it from the beginning. Now they have different reactions. So what's important in this first, especially the first few chapters, is learning these characters. And so with these four kids, you want to see how they react to different situations because it tells you a lot about them. Okay, so you have Lucy who you see her in the beginning. She's a little nervous. The professor makes her uneasy. Um, every little kind of noise in the house makes her a little nervous and scared because it's all new and she's the youngest. Um, Peter, you can see he's brave and bold. And for him, this is a huge adventure where he can go and explore and see new things. You have Susan and you can tell she's a motherly figure in here. Um, and she tries to follow the rules, be prim and proper and kind of be a good guide for her siblings. And then you have Edmund who from the beginning wants to make fun of the, the professor um, he mouths off to Susan when she's trying to get them to go to bed. Um, from the beginning, you can tell out of the four, he has a demeanor that can possibly lead him into a little bit of trouble. Okay, So they make a plan the next day to go and explore because it's a huge house. It's in the middle of the country, lots of animals, things to see, and they can't go. Why? Because it's raining. So instead of exploring outside, it's a huge house. Let's explore inside. So they go into all of these crazy rooms, one that's all green, books upon books in other rooms, and then they get to this room that seems kind of plain and simple and not very interesting. And so Lucy, who's a little inquisitive, sees the wardrobe that's there and she opens it and it says she loves fur coats. She loves the way they smell and they feel upon her skin. So why not go in there and just see the different fur coats and she keeps walking and she keeps walking and then uh, she you know has the crunch under her feet and it's no longer soft fur against her skin and it feels like tree branches and so eventually um, it says something cold and soft was falling on her and then she's standing in the middle of a wood in the middle of the night with snow under her feet and the snowflakes falling through the air so You'll notice it says over and over again, she left the door open, which is important, okay? Because if you don't leave the door open, how do you know where to go back out? So she leaves it open and she can kind of see the light there. And <clears throat> as she's looking around, 
She's there and she finds the lamp post. Okay. And all of a sudden, there's a strange person that walks out from the trees. And his description should look very familiar to you from our readings in mythology. Half human. And we have the goat hooves at the bottom. And it's got the black fur. The little horns out of his head. And we meet, which should sound familiar, as satyr from mythology. And we meet, he's called a fawn there, Mr. Tumnus. Okay? So, Mr. Tumnus over and over again talks about daughter of Eve, daughter of Eve. And so, you'll notice the individuals that are living in Narnia, where it's winter, have no idea what a human is. Okay? And so he keeps asking, are you a daughter of Eve? And we know Adam and Eve. But as far as Lucy, she's like, I don't get what you're saying. And immediately when he's asking that, you should think to yourself, why doesn't he know what a human is? And why is he so concerned if she is one? So once he figures out that she is actually a daughter of Eve, as he calls, okay, um, you find out that they're in Narnia, okay? And they talk about how, you know, Lucy comes from a place where it's summer and all of that. And then here, it's eternally winter. It's always cold ever since a certain lady took control, okay? So they're laughing, they're talking. Mr. Tumnus seems pretty hospitable and you can tell Lucy is very nice as well. So... <clears throat> You have this one little line, though. It says, um, if you will take my arm, because he invites her to tea, I shall be able to hold the umbrella of her, both of us. Um, now that's the way. And you see where there's a, um, they go, off we go, and, and they're talking. And you see Mr. Tumnus, as he talks to Lucy, he kind of pauses and he's like, he almost says something he shouldn't. So you can tell he's kind of hiding something, Okay. So they eventually find his cave. It's nice and warm and homey. And Lucy comes in. And you notice the books that are on the shelf. The Life and Letters of Selenus. Hmm. Mythology. King Midas. Okay. Um, and it goes through and describes the lovely tea. And he tells, just like Selenus, wonderful stories. Okay. And um, he even talks about Selenus and his donkey and Bacchus. That should all sound familiar to you, okay? And he begins to play this music. And this music makes Lucy feel all these different types of emotions. And it's almost like she gets swept up in it and she's in almost a, it's kind of cramped-like, okay? And then, <clears throat> of course, we know she doesn't intend to stay very long, but because of this music... She stays much longer than she anticipates, and she's got to rush out to leave. And then all of a sudden, Mr. Tumnus cries. And just like Lucy does, you should be thinking, why in the world is he so upset? And through his sobbing, you find out he's done something he feels in his conscience that he knows he shouldn't have done. So that's important because you see that a lot in here. People know that in their gut or in their conscience that God gives them, that God gives all of us, that something isn't right. And they shouldn't be doing that, but they listen like tumness to the white witch or Satan that tells us, oh, it's not a big deal to do this, or I need you to do this, that um, he makes the choice to uh, kidnap her or attempt to, because um, it says he has to serve the white witch, right? And any daughter of Adam or Eve, he's supposed to hand over to her. So immediately you should ask, why in the world does she want them? What's their purpose? And you can already tell she's evil. So in your mind, you should already know that, well, it's probably not a good purpose. So in this little section, okay, um, when he talks to Lucy, um, he knows that he's, if, the White Witch finds out that he didn't take Lucy to her. I mean, the punishment is severe. But he decides not to pay attention to that fear and go with his conscience and what he knows is right and to let Lucy go. So he rushes her back in unlike the 
um, beautiful trip to his home. This one, it's very secretive, secretive. It's rushed. They stay in the darkness so nobody can find them. And then he, before she leaves, of course, he begs for her forgiveness. And you see, and this is important, Lucy freely gives her um, forgiveness and doesn't hold anything against him. That part's important about her character. So Lucy goes back in the professor's mansion and she, I mean, she feels like she's been gone for hours. So she's expecting that her siblings will be looking. And when she finds them, it's like no time has passed. They're like, we just left the room. So for them, they listen to Lucy and her story and they just think, I mean, why is she telling us this lie? Is she just trying to be silly? And they go and check the wardrobe. There's nothing there. And the two older siblings, I mean, they let it go. But you notice one basically rags her about it. And for Lu I mean, we, have all, we all have siblings. Or if you do, uh, think about the time where you've done something and then you have a sibling that just will not let it go and teases you about it all the time. And that's what Edmund is doing to Lucy because he enjoys it and he enjoys seeing her kind of frustrated. But you also see in there about Lucy's character is that she wholeheartedly is truthful and doesn't lie. So when somebody thinks she's not telling the truth, it really bothers her. So through this whole thing, <clears throat> it said Edmund could be spiteful. And on this occasion, he was very spiteful. And it went on and on and on. And they never could, she, she never could find a way back to Narnia until, here's your parallel, here's something that links it together, the rain comes again one day, okay? So, they're playing hide and seek, which is awesome, an awesome game, okay? And she goes and she hides in the wardrobe, and then Edmund follows her in there. Not necessarily because he thinks it's a great hiding place, but just because... I can tease her some more in here. So as he follows her in, the same kind of process happens. He's looking for her. He can't find her. He's getting a little worried. And then all of a sudden, he finds this place that Lucy was telling the truth about. Okay. So when he gets in there, he forgets about Lucy, goes towards um, like the the woods that there's that are there. Sorry about that. And he's kind of just totally awestruck that this here's this new place. And then <clears throat> it says that um, when he gets in there, this is important. He immediately shivers. And we know it's winter. We knows it. We know it's cold. But there's another reason that he shivers. Okay. So he shouts for Lucy. He's trying to find her really because, I mean. Although he doesn't like to admit that he's wrong, he needs to. And then he doesn't find her anywhere. And all of a sudden, he hears the bells and here comes the sleigh. Okay. So uh, we have the sleigh with the uh, white stags and we have the dwarf that's driving it. And then we have the great lady, taller than any woman that Edmund had ever seen. She also was covered in white fur up to her throat and had a long, straight golden wand in her right hand and wore a golden crown on her head. Her face was white, not merely pale, but white like snow or paper or icing sugar, except for her very red mouth. It was a beautiful face in other respects, but proud and cold and stern. And so it says as she's coming up there that Edmund does not like there's there's things that he noticed that makes him uneasy about her okay it even says like in his gut he can tell that he probably shouldn't be talking to her and that um he didn't like the way she was looking at him and you can tell like is that any way to address your queen so you can tell she's very um arrogant and how she deals with people who she feels are underneath her and you can also tell in this little awkward conversation that Edmund is uneasy to talk to her. And she's looking at him and just like with Tumnus, she has no idea that he's a human being, a son of Adam, if you will. Um, she doesn't have any idea who he is or what he is. Okay. And that's where our chapter three 
ends. So you can kind of guess in the next chapter, it kind of leads you into it. Well, if she, I mean, think about how adamant and firm and stern she actually is. You know, she's going to get to the bottom of why Edmund in there is there. Well, where he comes from and who he truly is. And that's chapters one through three.